for joining us tonight. My name is Luke Dezatola, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight for this event. In 1988, Vito Russo, the man we remember tonight, spoke at an ACT UP demonstration. AIDS is really a test for us as a people. <coughs> when future generations ask what we did in this crisis, we're going to have to tell them that we were out here today. And we have to leave the legacy for to those generations of people who will come after us. Vito Russo's life and le legacy is beautifully captured in the new book by Michael Chiavi, a professor of English who has written for numerous periodicals. His book is entitled Celluloid Activist, The Life and Times of Vito Russo. Vito was a gay civil rights activist, a founding member of GLAAD and co-founder of ACT UP, and an historian he wrote the fundamental work on queer film studies entitled The Celluloid Closet, Homosexuality in the Movies. And to those who knew of him in his time or were even luckier to know him up close, he was dynamic and passionate and set the standard for how we measure a courageous man. Joining Michael tonight is Vito's brother, Charlie, who was an essential source for celluloid activists and fellow writers and activists, Vito's best friend, Arnie Kantrowitz, and journalist and national talk radio host Michelangelo Signorelli, who can provide their own perspective on Vito's life and legacy. In the, in the late 1970s, I met Vito when he was waiting tables at the Om, Omnibus restaurant down in the West Village. As I learned from Michael's book, Vito liked to bitch and moan when he was working at the Omnibus that too many gays weren't concerned with anything in the world, except where was the next bar? <laughs> Perhaps that's why he enjoyed our brief but serious conversation about <coughs> film. Then again, maybe we were just flirting with each other. It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I remember that moment actually vividly. Like other gay men whose lives were cut short, he seems now like a daring young man on a flying trapeze. I'm very pleased to be able to host tonight's event, Remembering Vito Russo. Please join me in welcoming all of us. Thank you. I'm just amazed by how many people here. This is wonderful. And I'm assuming that many of you actually knew Vito, and I didn't. And so you're, you have an advantage over me here. Um, I would like to say just by way of introduction, because uh, Lou gave a very lovely introduction to Vito, and I'm, I'm guessing that many of you knew who he was and don't need much, sorry, don't need much uh, detail. But I would just like to say personally, I came to this project when I was 17 years old, when I discovered Celluloid Closet on a library shelf uh, in college, and was closeted and terrified and actually found that there was this book that dealt with homosexuality and the movies, my two favorite things, <laughs> and a life, a, a career was born. So I'm just overwhelmed to be here after all these years talking about Vito. Um, I, I would like to just say a, a little bit of introduction before I, I do this reading from the book. Vito is, of course, as Lou said, you know, known for writing The Cellular Closet and being a co-founder of GLAAD and ACT UP, but uh, Vito was an activist long before all of that. He was a member of Gay Activists Alliance, which, as many of you know, was one of the first organizations right after Stonewall to uh, start to galvanize gay rights. Uh, Vito's contribution to GAA was enormous. He was the first person to politicize the movies, to inform people that what we were seeing on the screen about gays and lesbians had a direct impact on how people viewed gays and lesbians in society. Uh, that if on the screen all we ever saw were clowns and victims and villains and murderers, then no wonder we were being bashed in society, no wonder there were laws against us, and he determined to make a difference, uh, to, to change perceptions, and that's what the cellular closet was all about. Within GAA, he had a unique and very <coughs> important function, which was that um, the GAA was kind of divided between people who were extremely political and people like Vito who were more on the entertainment side of things. Vito firmly believed in politics, believed in being in the streets and screaming and, and getting uh, meetings with uh, city councilmen, but he also believed that there were a lot of people in the gay movement who could be reached through entertainment, um, which is, going back to the movies that were his passion from uh, early childhood, he thought that if he could bring people into GAA and entrance them through movies, uh, then he would have a chance of 
bring them really into the movement itself. So what I want to read from you, read to you from my book is uh, two little sections on his contribution to Gay Activists Alliance, where he uh, more or less invented what was called the cabaret night and also uh, a film night. To Vito, the cabaret was a place where gay performers could relax and be themselves. Actor-singer John Paul Hudson knew well actors' terror of appearing gay to closeted what he called asshole agents. <coughs> Before Stonewall, he recalled, there was no place you could sing. There was no place where you could learn your craft as a performer without doing straight material, singing love songs with a feminine pronoun as if you meant it, hiding, hiding, hiding. Vito designed the cabaret to provide artists a rare opportunity for honesty. For some men, he proudly remarked, this is the first time they can be in front of an audience and sing a love song to a man. Determined to showcase uncloseted performers with maximum gloss, Vito engaged two Broadway designers, George James and John Dinsmore, who doused the stage with red and gold glitter. Installed as light man, Vito's lover Steve Krotz rigged up donated globe footlights and flashing marquee bulbs to illuminate the sparkling silver lambda over the stage. The whole effect reminded Vito of Debbie Reynolds in the ornate home of her most famous film character. <laughs> it was, he proclaimed, Molly Brown's drawing room in Denver, and I love it. <laughs> the glitzy set did not put all performers at ease. Steve, for example, had never sung as an openly gay man. And he recalled, I just kind of froze and totally screwed it up the first time. His experience was not unique. At an early cabaret night, John Paul despaired to hear male singers inserting, out of beaten habit, female pronouns into their repertoire. Vito and Arnie begged that he reserve judgment for future shows. It didn't take long for things to loosen up. Free beer flowed along with open affection from grateful audiences. John Paul found gay audiences more gentle, more encouraging, more compassionate than their straight counterparts. Gays, knowing what it is like to be on display and to be unwanted, turned down, were willing to give nervous performers like Steve a second chance. MC Rusty Blitz, who had appeared in Mel Brooks' film The Producers and would go on to Young Frankenstein as well as Sid and Nancy, was happy to throw struggling performers a lifeline. As a result, the quality of the acts improved and became more diverse. Vita was especially taken by one fellow, whom he called a knockout in his boa, singing Bessie Smith's blues with gay abandon. <laughs> blues and folk predominated, but the cabaret offered considerable comedy as well. Most popular was teenage Nancy Jo Parker, who recited the entire Wizard of Oz script, <laughs> complete with flutey Billy Burke and raging Margaret Hamilton imitations. When she warbled over the rainbow, a la Liza Minnelli, Vito quipped, there wasn't a dry seat in the house. <laughs> <laughs> While laboring to get the cabaret off the ground, Vito was even busier with his primary contribution to GAA, the firehouse flicks shown on Friday nights and Sunday afternoons. He decided to start things off light and sexy. Roman Polanski's The Fearless Vampire Killers featured a baroquely queenie vampire in lust with Polanski himself. The firehouse audience loved it. <coughs> Noting their shared laughter, Vito announced, You've heard people argue about whether there's a gay sensibility? Well, you just experienced it. Vito built a repertoire around films that he had seen with straight audiences, but wanted to watch again in an all-gay setting. As he quickly realized, gays pick up on things that straight audiences miss, an innuendo, the direction, the way a scene is played. It also seems like gay audiences are always pulling for the underdog, he said. He wanted to use the, film as spring he wanted to use the films as springboards for discussion of machismo, sexism, gender role-playing, romance, violence, and the denigration of gays and lesbians in Hollywood films. Audiences were electrified. During Gay Pride Week 1971, Vito showed the Battle of Algiers, which sent his troops back up Sixth Avenue, screaming for their own freedom. In honor of the following year's Pride, he hosted an all-night screening that participant Dan Allen pro proclaimed wall-to-wall -wall groovy. Hundreds of spectators sprawled across the floor in sleeping bags or over one another in cuddly couples. Vito's, uh, beginning at 8 p.m. on Friday and continuing well into Saturday morning, Vito's program was aimed squarely at male spectators, and the films included The Women, Funny Girl, paired with Vito's own copy of the television special My Name is Barbara, a Judy Garland special from what he called one of her worst years, <laughs> Wait Until Dark, Rock Around the Clock, which prompted a 4 a.m. dance riot, a trailer for Cabaret, which was only recently released to theaters, and the 8 a.m. finale of Gypsy, for which only a hundred <laughs> stalwart souls remained awake. Dan <laughs> Allen crowed over the marathon celebration of gay unity, commenting, the mood of the audience moved me because the atmosphere pulsated with enthusiasm, sending good vibrations bouncing around and all through the place. Since the 1940s, I've seldom seen a movie audience so vibrant. The crowd screamed for Judy and cackled over Marjorie Maine's sarcastic sexist dialogue in The Women. And they had the unprecedented chance to salivate, without fear of assault, 
over the beefcake images of Alan Arkin, Omar Sharif, and Bill Haley. The flicks were designed for people like Fred Goldhaber, who I must say just recently passed away, so I'm very touched that I can read this about him. Flicks were designed for people like Fred Goldhaber, a closeted 24-year-old teacher who attended Vito's Halloween 1971 double feature, Village of the Damned, and Night of the Living Dead. Fred was dragged to the firehouse by GAA member Steve Ashkenazi, who wanted to give his friend a sink or swim introduction to gay culture. As Village of the Damned began, the audience responded with happy fright. They would, Fred recalled, shriek and turn to the person <laughs> on the left or the right, and they would hug and hide their eyes in the other person's armpits, and it was simply wonderful. It was so much fun, and I found myself doing it too. I lost all my inhibitions. It was hypnotic, intoxicating, just glorious. I had never in my life experienced such freedom. Fred laughed along with everyone else when a lesbian yelled at Night of the Living Dead's flesh-eating zombies, Save me a breast! <laughs> <laughs> Amid the chills and giggles, Fred found himself in the arms of his seatmate. The next morning, the pair shared what Fred calls a Vito Russo moment on the platform at Grand Central Station. And he said, Wayne took me in his arms, and he gave me the most glorious kiss. I mean, one of those Jennifer Jones, Claudette Colbert kisses, you know, where you're going off to war. Actually, I guess I was, because at that moment, I became a soldier in the army of the gay rights movement. Fred attributes his coming out to what he called Vito's magic, a softer, more welcoming version of GAA that was not available at the political demonstrations. Fourteen years later, he joined the faculty of New York's Harvey Milk High School, thus becoming the world's first teacher in a gay high school. An accomplishment, he remarks, that had much to do with GAA and Vito, the pride that he had in being who he was, and finding all these things in the movies, and celebrating the gay image. Thank you. And now we're going to do a little panel discussion. I've got several questions for each of my wonderful colleagues and friends up here. Uh, all of whom knew Vito in very different circumstances. And we're going to start in chronological order with Charlie, since he's, he knew Vito the longest. Can you speak into the mic? So, <coughs> oh, can everybody hear me? Now? Can now? Yes? OK. Yeah. So, Charlie. Oh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Charlie, what are your earliest memories of Vito and the movies? Which movies did he like best? Well, we grew up in uh, East Harlem, New York, and uh, going to the movies with Vito was an experience. Uh, he always started out uh, with horror films, and it's really interesting. The one that uh, he scared me each night with uh, was uh, someone who just passed away recently, uh, where he was going to put the pods under my bed, so if I fell asleep, <laughs> you know, I would become one of them. So. Yeah, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which was a, a wonderful movie, and it's a classic today. Although when it came out, it wasn't, it wasn't very uh, well received. We used to go to a, a theater on 116th Street uh, called the Cosmo, and my mom and dad would give us one dollar, and we would spend the day there. And, uh, you know, Vita would always try and horn in on my money, because he spent his as soon as we got in there. And he just loved the movies. Uh, once we got a little older, we would get the Second Avenue bus and go to 86th Street because there was a whole bunch of theaters that we could choose from. And then we kind of got into the uh, musicals. And he would take me to see things like uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy. And, uh, you know, Vito loved the movies. And if he could be anywhere, uh, he wanted to be in the movies. And I just, I just want to say that when I, I love your book, uh, we met uh, right by my daughter's uh, favorite restaurant, this little Bubby's in uh, Tribeca. And when I met Michael, it took like 10 minutes for me to say, this is the man to tell Vito's story. Because uh, mm -hmm. immediately, uh, the goodness that Vito had in him came out of Michael. And I said, this, this is the person that needs to do it. Ironically, is Vito, who loved the movies more than anything in the world, eventually finds out that it's the movies who are perpetuating uh, the stereotypes and it are the engine that are, are causing the pain and the oppression. And he went to slay that dragon and it was quite a dragon that he, he had a slave, which was Hollywood. And it, it took 30 years, but uh, we finally reached it. Well, can you just talk about uh, the movies that Vito would show at home on his projector when he was <laughs> One Christmas, Vito, uh, our parents gave him a, a very small little projector, and they gave him movies like uh, Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein, and um, the, uh, the, the Dead End Kids, 
three stooges, and he would get all the kids in the neighborhood, and we would sit in, in front of a sheet, and Vita would uh, play the movies and get the reaction from the group. Okay. And you know, you told me in our interviews that you couldn't imagine two brothers more different than you and Vito. Like, how is that true? Well, I was I was a three sport athlete at, at Lodi, and uh, Vito, you know, he didn't. <laughs> he never picked up a baseball or, or got involved in what was going on the streets, the stickball, the football, the basketball. We were really opposite, but we had, uh, we had quite a relationship. Uh, and uh, it played out that uh, you know, when he got sick, uh, it became a very difficult time in all our lives. And uh, you know, I guess we'll talk about that a little later. But you know, we were able to forge a very special relationship at, at a time that uh, at a time where people were not embracing uh, their gay brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and we had a very special parents that taught us that. Uh, you know, my mom became a champion of gay rights, and my dad, who grew up uh, and should have been in the mafia because he, he came right out of he came right out of a Goodfellas movie, uh, and he was a construction worker who was in an environment uh, the most homophobic environment ever, but he was able to transcend that because. Uh, his love for Vito trumped all that. So it, it was really good to uh, come out of the family. And, and I, I know Arnie and, <coughs> and all his friends that are here tonight can talk about how uh, the Russo household was one that you could come and we, you were received with open arms and you were able to get the uh, ravioli and crab <laughs> sauce and everything else. Charlie, can you talk about what do you think it was like for Vito growing up as a gay kid in East Harlem and then in Lodi? Vito took a lot of abuse uh, <coughs> in East Harlem. Uh, we, we went to Holy Rosary School, so you, you kind of had a target on you. You wore a uh, blue pants, white shirt, and a blue tie with gold HRS across you. So you, were, you, know, you had a bullseye on you. And as we would walk the streets, uh, the taunts of homo, faggot, and queer uh, just jumped uh, off the stoops and off the, cars, the car hoods. And uh, Vito went through quite a lot. And he experienced uh, pretty much the same thing when he went to Lodi High School. How do you think he got through all that? Well, I think that he got, uh, he was empowered by my parents. He knew that he had a strong base, and eventually that strong base also moved over to his friends because he had a very strong gay family also. So Vito had two very strong bases, his biological family and his gay family. <coughs> okay. And then also just, um, you know, one of Vito's biggest public events was in 1987 when he emceed the New York City Gay Men's Chorus concert, which was called The Movies. Um, a whole evening dedicated to movie music, and um, you were there. And yeah, you I, it was just amazing. You know, Vito, Vito took us all everywhere. You know, as my mother wrote in her memoir, uh, Vito was her eyes to a new world and a new culture. Uh, she wrote that uh, he took her to her first opera, which was Madame Butterfly, uh, to garden parties at MoMA, and uh, the night we all, and there's a beautiful picture in the book, of us all meeting at uh, Lincoln Center to see Vito MC uh, the event. And when he came out in his tux and his beautiful tie, he just mesmerized the entire audience. There was laughter from when he walked out there till the end of the event. And I, you know, I was just awestruck at, at what he can do. Uh, he, was, he was just an amazing person. If you got to meet Vito for five minutes, you fell in love with him. And I think that's what he was upset at. He would always think, you know, you don't like me and you don't even know me. Give me a chance. And if anyone, all my friends, whenever all my friends got to meet him, they fell in love with him. And, and that's what he was trying to do. He was trying to say, give me a chance, you know, and don't judge me. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. So now we're going to move to Arnie Kantrowitz, who was Vito's best friend for 20 years and uh, a very important author and activist in his own right. Um, Arnie, how did you meet Vito and what were your first impressions of him? Uh, a friend of mine uh, named Mike Morrissey, who was a member of Gay Activist Alliance, which I had just joined, uh, told me that I had to meet this guy. And um, this was not a sexual liaison. Um, <laughs> and he took me to a restaurant called The Omnibus, where uh, Vito was the waiter. And as Charlie said, like everyone else, I fell in love with him immediately. Um, Vito had charisma or charm so that people always fell under his sway. Um, 
he also was very hard to catch because he was in constant motion. <laughs> Especially as a waiter where he wanted to uh, bring the dishes to the, to the table. Um, <coughs> soon after that, uh, both of us were in GAA and it was meeting at a place called the Church of the Holy Apostles on, on 28th <coughs> Street and 9th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And Vito lived on 24th Street and 9th Avenue. So after meeting, some of us would start drifting down to his house where we could um, look at movies and um, be together. His favorite movie that I remember was called Caged. <laughs> it was uh, the story of a women's prison. <laughs> and he liked it for his opening line, which was uh, given to the women who were just arriving at the prison and, and the paddy wagon. <coughs> Pile out, you tramps, it's the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> do not stay friends with somebody like <laughs> Okay, so Ernie, how would you describe the Activist Alliance in 1970 when you and Vito joined it? It might have looked chaotic, but <laughs> we had our rules. Um, it was an amazing amalgam of people. When uh, I first joined in the Church of the Holy Apostles, there were maybe 75 to 100 people at the first meeting that I went to. And I was very impressed with them. This was me coming out of the closet. I had never done anything gay. I had never been to a gay bar. Um, I did manage to get the sex part done with, without the uh, accoutrements. But um, <laughs> I... Uh, I, I felt like these people were my people, all of a sudden. It was a little like going to uh, uh, a synagogue and feeling that this is your people. Only I felt more of it with the Gay Activist Alliance. Um, I've never been too big on synagogues anyway. Um, within a short time, the number of people grew and grew. Uh, we had characters like uh, Eric Forndale, walked around barefoot with a gold dollar sign around his neck. Um, Arthur Evans, who was an anarchist who wrote our constitution. <laughs> <laughs> and well done, he did it. Uh, we uh, got much bolder as time went on. And we, um, uh, the organization was formed, I should say, in response to previous organization, the Gay Liberation Front, and um, a number of people, about a dozen people from the Gay Liberation Front, felt that they were uh, caught in their ideological arguments and they weren't getting things done. So they decided to form an organization that had um, uh, nonviolence in its constitution and um, to stage actions that would uh, draw attention to the situation of gay people. And soon after that, we, we moved into the firehouse, was, uh, maybe after the first year. And then the meetings swelled. There would be three or 400 people at a meeting. Um, we had a little coffee shop upstairs. We tried to show uh, videotapes of our zaps. That's when we had these um, actions. Uh, against politicians or media people, and um, nobody wanted to look at the gaps. They wanted to look at each other. What can you remember about the genesis of the site of the closet? I mean, long before Vito wrote the book, how did he start getting going with the lectures, and what were the responses? Even before the firehouse flicks um, that you described so well, uh, Vito celebrated the first Gate Pride Week, which was the first anniversary of the um, Stonewall Riots, uh, by showing a film called uh, Gold Diggers of 1935, or 33, <laughs> one of them. Um, and it was his idea immediately to uh, bring something that gay people would enjoy to a gay audience. and. Uh, these were the first times that gay people
could see each other reacting. Usually gay people were scattered among uh, non-gay people and uh, had to bite their tongues if they thought something was funny. But um, here everybody laughed at the same wrong places <laughs> and had a wonderful time doing it. This eventually grew into the Gay Film Festival, um, which will happen uh, next month. Uh, it's a good number of years old by now. Oh, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Vito uh, started um, collecting information about movies. He began to see patterns in what we were showing, and as Charlie said, in movies about gays, we were either villains or sissies or uh, clowns of some sort. Um, and so he wanted to document all of this. He worked at the Museum of Modern Art, and so he was able to look at a lot of films there. And he was plaguing everybody for films. And he, um, <coughs> he was able to um, piece together um, an entire pattern started out small and started out with looking at a few film clips which he uh, somewhat illegally <coughs> from, uh, from movies um, and uh, he figured as long as he didn't know it, anything who would care. So um, he started giving lectures uh, using this group of film clips. Uh, I remember at one time I tried to interfere by um, telling him that it might be interesting to put all the uh, suicides and murders of gay people uh, at the end of the lecture to show what became of all the characters he was discussing. He tried it once, and uh, the audience came out so depressed <laughs> <laughs> that they decided to, he decided to weave it in in another way. And it's there, but it's not all on top of everything. And I think in the back of his book, The Society of Closet, there is a necrology of gays who died in films. Um, if I could just jump in, Vito had a wonderful quote. Uh, he said, if every movie that you saw, heterosexuals committed suicide at the end, you would think something's wrong with them. And I, th I think that really nailed it, you know? So I I'm sorry. There are people in the uh, film criticism world, in the film theory world, um, in the graduate school world, who uh, think that Vito's work uh, is all politics and no theory. And they resent it for that reason, because they want to write about uh, theory, about constructionism, etc. cetera. Um, I think that Michael makes a good case for this as well, that uh, Vito um, sorry, that he uh, was able to um, put together something that had not been put together before. After what became years of research, he finally um, had this huge catalog of films and uh, he managed to break them down into decades and have a different theme for each decade. So I think it was the sissy in the 1930s um, and uh, the hidden gay in some of the 1940s films, um, all done with innuendo and uh, if you knew the secret code, it was there. And once he revealed it to you, it was hard to see it any other way. Um, and Rebecca and Judith Anderson, stroking Rebecca's fur coat, you know, in adoration. Um, things like that took on a different cast. Um, when Vito went to uh, write his book, he thought he was ready at first. This was around 1973. Um, and he uh, and I and uh, his partner of the moment um, went to Fire Island, spent the whole summer. I was typing away at my autobiography, which someone asked me to sign just before I, <laughs> this is like, how many years later? <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. Um, and Vito was not typing at all. He 
would get dressed up in this flowing caftan every day and sit in front of the typewriter, <laughs> making a wonderful silhouette. <laughs>